Welcome to the Inclusive Ship Show, the place to get practical insights to make inclusion happen in the business world. My name is Thais Confan, I'm your host, and today I'm absolutely delighted and honored to be here with Nigel Miller, Senior Advisor, Employee Experience at Edelman, which is one of the leading, it is the leading uh, communications consultancy in the world. Nigel, welcome. Thank you so much for taking your time to be here with us today. Hello, Thais. It's really wonderful to, uh, to be here on the show. I've been a big fan of the show for some time, and uh, it's, uh, it's an honor for me to be here as well. Thank you. And well, Nigel, Nigel, also, you know that you happen to be one of the most inspiring leaders that I've ever met in my life. So I'm really honored. Well, and you inspired you. me a lot, you know, when I was writing my book, uh, Succeed as an Inclusive Leader. I really wanted to thank you for that. And uh, yeah, in prior to being as the Senior Advisor Employee Experience, you were the Chief Human Resources Officer at Edelman as well. Nigel, can you tell us a little bit more about what you are doing today and how, what you, what's your story? How did you become who you are? Well, great. Um, like lots of people, um, my adventure, my journey has been um, diverse in and of itself. And I, I'm a Canadian living in London. I've been with my family here for 10 years, uh, five years previous to that in Belgium. Um, and I uh, became an HR professional um, a slightly different path because I used to be in public affairs and communications. So I've kind of come full circle working at Edelman. Um, but it was with a, a real passion for employee engagement and the experience that employees have in organizations, again, as part of a public affairs function that ultimately led me to HR because that function when I was with AB InBev in Belgium was in the HR function. Um, and it was there that I saw the, I, I, I was more able to see the connectedness between employee engagement and the experience employees have and other drivers within the HR function. And then I was asked to, um, to take a, a larger HR role there and I kind of never looked back. Um, obviously, we worked together at Coca-Cola Enterprises, um, five years there. Um, and then, like I said, I kind of came full circle joining Edelman because I'd started in the public relations communications industry. And it was great to come back to the leader um, and in a global role, focused on HR for the last few years. Uh, and over the last couple of months, uh, I've been focused on external facing clients and helping clients to improve, to understand and improve their employee experience. Great. In how coming back to our topic of inclusive leadership and inclusion and diversity, Nigel, how do you define inclusion and diversity? And how do you see the connection with inclusion and diversity in you know, the employee experience topic? Well, I mean, starting with the last piece, and then I'll come back to it, is uh, I, I think I joined a wider chorus uh, of believers that diversity and inclusion is one of the core drivers uh, of the employee experience uh, in most organizations, and we'll, I know we'll talk about that. Um, but there's a couple of ways to answer this question, or many ways, in fact, defining uh, diversity and inclusion. It still depends on where you are in the world. Um, in the U.S., um, diversity has focused um, more on ethnicity and other things, of course, but ethnicity, whereas here in Europe, it tends to focus more on gender and sexual orientation. Uh, and then again, if you travel to other parts of the world, there'll be other focus areas for diversity in particular. But for me, and I think I'm joined by, by many um, in embracing a much broader definition of diversity first. Um, so it's more than race and age and, and sexual orientation and encompass, encompasses factors such as social class, physical ability, religious and, and political beliefs, all kind of rounding up to it, it's, it's embracing and empowering people by respecting and appreciate, appreciating what makes them different in, in your organization. 
So it's really creating that environment where all walks of life, shapes and sizes can, can flourish. And that's where we get to the, the inclusion piece because uh, I think most organizations recognize they need to, to draw from as diverse a talent pool as possible, but that's only half the battle. If you don't create a, an inclusive environment where all of those people and all of those backgrounds, all those thoughts, processes can flourish, um, then you're probably not going to get the return on that original investment. Right. In Nigel, you know, you, see, you know, the time from the time when we met at Coca-Cola Enterprises, uh, you have always seemed to me to be th that kind of leader who who practices inclusive leadership in such a natural way. You know, like you you get the benefits and in in the, the the right reasons for for becoming a more inclusive uh, leader and creating a more inclusive environment. How do you how do you influence others, you know, who don't get it as naturally as, as you, you seem to have got it? Which might not be the case. I don't know. You could, maybe you could also tell us how, how we became involved with inclusion. And, and most importantly, how we became such a, um, a role model, actually, by walking the talk and practicing, you know, inclusion in everyday life. Um, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't take as, as much credit as you give me. Um, I think I've been um, very fortunate to work for organizations where diversity and inclusion has been a high priority. I haven't had to do that much convincing um, because I've worked for that type of organization, at least in my last two, where we worked together at Coca-Cola Enterprises. And we hired you because there was a real understanding of the fact that this can make, if we get this right, if we get this right, it, it will not only be the right thing to do, but it will make a significant business difference. Um, so I believe that, I believe it wholeheartedly, um, but I've been part of, uh, I think, organizations who also believe it, so I haven't had to do that much convincing. I joined Edelman in part because our CEO, um, Richard Edelman has been very public about this topic, um, not just from a gender perspective, which has been uh, for many years probably the most talked about part of diversity and inclusion here at Edelman and in our industry, but it's much broader than that, much broader than that. And it starts, so many organizations, it starts at the top. Um, so in, in a way, it's been easier for me because I have joined the chorus and then it's been much more about the how. Uh, if your organization believes staunchly in this, how do you achieve a truly diverse and inclusive environment? Um, so, you know, for us, when I have to talk to people about the why, it's usually outside of my current organizations. It's in forums and places like that where I'll say, well, first of all, hopefully it's intuitively the right thing to do. Um, secondly, it is... Uh, I could show you, as you do, a wide range of, of data that will tell you that if you are effective in creating a diverse and inclusive environment, you will see better business results. And then you get down into the specifics where I actually am able to show a correlation between a diverse and inclusive environment and things like reduce, reduce turnover, higher innovation. And for us, it's what Richard talks about and I talk about and many of my colleagues talk about is, if we get this right, we're going to do better work. And that's ultimately what we're in business, to do better work, finding better solutions for our clients by better representing the communities that we serve. In getting down to, to the, the, the tactics of it, Nigel, and the hows, what is the most effective initiative that you've ever taken to drive inclusion and diversity? Well, you're going you're gonna to recognize this. I thought about this because I thought you might ask that. Um, I talk about it a lot. One of the most effective initiatives that I've seen and been a part of was actually recommended by you. Um, so we were at uh, Coca-Cola Enterprises had ambition. We were, as you recall, recruiting. This is about, at the time, it was about gender diversity and inclusion. We were doing everything we possibly could to convince engineers, um, female engineers, to come into our organization. 
Um, first of all, the challenge there is there a low percentage of female engineers. So we needed to invest in, in promoting our industry to people who might aspire to being an engineer and promote it to women. But we had, when we were beginning to, uh, to have more females in our plants, you'll recall that it was like a leaky bucket. They would join our organization and then leave very quickly. Um, and it was through the audit process of truly understanding what kind of an environment you are fostering where we started to unlock um, opportunities for change. And I know, you know, we were very proud to win a diversity and inclusion awards because the insights were uh, surprising to us um, that we had an environment that uh, in some cases uh, were not inclusive not accepting, not embracing of, of some uh, people that were working there. And when we started to make some small changes, everything changed. So for us, it, it, that, that's one thing um, that's something I think was very effective. And I look back at that and try to replicate that type of insight and thinking here is really try to understand what's happening in the environment. Is it inclusive of different types of thinking? Is it inclusive of different backgrounds? Uh, or are you doing things, even unconsciously, that may create barriers to A, attracting people, and B, importantly, retaining them? Yeah, it's amazing how sometimes when you hold the mirror to people and to leaders uh, with insights from the data, from focus groups, you know, it's, you can get a lot of traction, actually, because people realize where the gaps are, and also what they are getting right, because sometimes there are things, isn't it, that people are getting right? Oh, yeah. To encourage, I find as well, those, those behaviors. It's so, so true. I, I, one of the other things that uh, at Edelman has been very effective for us, and, and I know you have to do this carefully, is um, affinity groups or employee networks. Um, we've established uh, as many as six different employee networks. Um, and, you know, we may get into this, you know, one of the criticisms of employee networks or, or, or even diverse and inclusive efforts can be, some people would say, well, you're excluding, um, you know, some parts of your population. Mm -hmm. Well, we've been very conscious about the way that we communicate our employee networks here is to say that's not the idea. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The principle is inclusion. Um, and creating uh, environments within which people from, um, you know, we have a veterans group, for example, that's extended from the U.S. here to the U.K., so people who have actually been in the armed forces. Um, and by establishing an affinity group of those individuals, um, they have been able to, in the early days, feel a sense of belonging uh, in an environment that didn't have very many people from the armed forces. Um, but they welcome people from uh, all sorts of backgrounds. And it's, uh, so that's a sort of a more atypical affinity group. We have sexual orientation, gender, ethnicity, et cetera. And these have proven to be very effective for us. Oh, Nigel, I love what you said about uh, the importance of being inclusive when you are driving those uh, initiatives. The way you frame an, uh, an, an employee affinity group, that's so important. Um, yeah, it, it, it really is. Otherwise, it can have um, the opposite effect, I think. So as a leading communications consultancy, we, uh, we hope that we are doing a good job at communicating things. Um, <laughs> we don't always, right? We learn from our mistakes. But on this one, it's been, uh, it's been something that we've focused a lot on. In, in your experience, what is the biggest mistake to avoid? Um, I think there's, there's a couple of things. Uh, one is, is um, how do I describe it? It, it is, um, let me phrase it a different way. Quality, when you're recruiting, um, when you're recognizing, when you're promoting um, uh, people in your organization, your first priority should be um, performance and quality and fit, et cetera. Um, I think we have tried to avoid uh, and I know organizations who have been successful that have tried to avoid saying, you're recruited, you're promoted, you're recognized because you come from a diverse part of the population. Um, I, I think you probably agree when you're focusing on effective diversity and inclusion programs, you want to avoid 
saying that, um, but rather what you're doing is opening your aperture, is to say, we are going to go into communities, we are going to reach far beyond where we had before to make sure that our talent pool, and then ultimately, by creating an inclusive environment, our employee base is going to be really diverse. Um, and we believe that by doing that, um, we can just we can recognize quality. Uh, we're going to get the best candidates because we've looked much further. That candidate may or may not be diverse, but we're going to get the best candidates, and we'll have a higher percentage of diversity because we've looked much further. Um, so we don't have to put um, uh, metrics on it. We don't have to force um, a diversity into the mix. Um, we're just opening our aperture and uh, and avoiding that. No, I think that's one, one thing to, uh, to avoid for sure. In the second one? Um, I think the second one is, it's changing, is to focus only on diversity without inclusion. Um, is, and I said this at the outset, is you have to do both. You absolutely have to do both. And, and really focus, as I said, that experience that we had together on the diversity and inclusion audits was really telling uh, and really eye-opening that we were recruiting uh, diverse parts of the population uh, and new types of profiles without thinking about um, and amending the environment within which they were going to work. So in that case, you had um, you know, a plant environment that had been almost entirely male and the people working there, unbeknownst to themselves, we're doing and saying things and acting in certain ways that that were not inclusive. Um, but again, importantly, not really knowing it. And once once we were able to kind of call things out and, and change some of make simple changes to some of those behaviors, um, and I think we we went a long way. The other thing, and I draw this actually from your book. It's it's related. I remember writing this down. I I, I got the book out on the weekend. Uh, and I'd made, I put sticky notes and, and highlights in it. And one of the things that I loved about it was we all, we all grew up or most of us grew up with the advice that, you know, we should treat others like we would like to be treated. Um, and your advice is that's another mistake that you can make because if, if I were to treat everyone here like I'd like to be treated, I would be completely missing the boat because not everyone here likes the same things that I like. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone here has come from the same background that I've come from. So what I might like to eat in the canteen or what time I'd like to start work um, or whether, you know, I, you know, take a team out to a certain type of restaurant in the evening because that's the way I'd like to be treated is not relevant when it comes to diversity and inclusion. It's much more relevant. So that other piece of advice that we all grew up with Make sure you take the opportunity to walk in another's shoes. That's good advice. I think it's still apl applicable in this context. Um, and the principle, of course, of treating people with respect and treating people with the kind of respect that you'd like to be treated with, absolutely still applicable. But taking that analogy too far and assuming if I like it, they'll like it mm -hmm. is a mistake. Yeah. No, I, I love the way you, you, you put it because it shows that treating others as we'd like to be treated, it's not a bad idea, but you know, a better idea even is to treat others as they'd like yeah. to be treated, the platinum yeah. rule. Yeah, yeah. And, and I do, you did mention the non-inclusive behaviors. In, mm -hmm. in your experience, what is the best way to respond to non-inclusive behaviors? First off, you know, uh, maybe a, a hint of optimism here, despite some of the things that are going on in the world today, um, which are deeply disturbing. Um, my, ex my first hand experience of dealing with clients and dealing in our own organization is the tolerance for non-inclusive behavior is wearing pretty thin in most organizations. Um, uh, organizations have policies, um, processes, and environments um, that I'd like to think, that's me being an optimist, in most places are far more inclu in inclusive. Um, and so that's, that's my starting point. I think it comes back though to this other point because there are obviously still issues. And um, 
and those issues are more prevalent in some places than in some organizations and in some industries, for sure, is it comes back to that advice that we just talked about. If you can be transparent about what kind of environment you're trying to achieve, um, what behaviors are acceptable and unacceptable. Um, we believe in storytelling here at Edelman, so you can sometimes do that in a very nice and, and even an entertaining way. Um, but it's important, however you do it, to be very transparent. Um, and then to come back to that analogy is when there are behaviors that you would consider to be offside, crossing the line, not inclusive, we could talk about this for the rest of our time. Um, but giving people the opportunity in whatever way you do it to walk in another's shoes and give them a sense of what it would feel like to experience what you've made them experience. How, again, however you do that um, is probably going to be about the best advice you could give is once they realize, oh, oh by saying that, by doing that, by acting that way, if I were in that person's shoes, it would feel like this. Um, if you can create that sense of awareness, I think you'll go a long way towards improvement. Yeah, and, and it's so true, Nigel, that many people who are doing or saying non-inclusive things, they don't realize, isn't it? It's that no. what, what it's missing is that realization of the impact that you are having on people, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you and I have talked about this before and we've done some work together in this space. Um, this notion of unconscious bias, um, which is prevalent in, in, in your book. It, it's prevalent, I think, as a, um, a reasonably high priority among diversity and inclusion programs. And, and on its own, it's not, it won't tend to be very effective, but coupled with other initiatives, um, giving people a sense of their own unconscious bias so they realize what it is, is a good first step. It's not easy to do. I know you do it well, um, and, but people have to open themselves up to that. Actually, when I'm in this situation, I, I know that I can tend to think this way. Mm -hmm. So I need to make sure I'm aware of that. Um, and, you know, for example, not necessarily just go with my gut. Someone appears a certain way in an interview, for example, and, and my gut might say one thing. And, um, going through a proper process may, may, may lead to a different outcome, a very different outcome. And I know myself, we all have it. We all have our own unconscious bias. And uh, I know that if I stick to a process, my initial instinct um, may be proven wrong. And, and what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given, Nigel? Um, on, on, on this topic, um, so we, we've, we've talked about a couple of these things is walk a mile in another's shoes and find some way to, to do that is, is really important. We've, we've learned that from the time we were born almost is once you've done that, you'll realize what it feels like to be them. If you don't, and, and, and it's funny, we've been, we've been brought up to think that way and then you look around in the world today. And increasingly, for a whole host of reasons, we are living in bubbles, and we're less tolerant in many respects to others' points of views. That's why we see what's happening in countries, in politics, uh, you know, in in debates. We are not um, we're not doing our best to truly understand other perspectives in the world today, which is ironic, given we've been taught to do that from the earliest possible age. I think that's one thing in organizations if you are truly committed to driving diversity and inclusion, you're not only focused on things that are visible, you're also focused on things that are not very visible. Um, and, they, and they may be perspectives. They may be religious points of view. They may be political points of view. Your organization, if it's, if it's ideal, will be a melting pot of those things. And you're going to create an environment where those things can flourish side by side. Not easy. It can be very difficult. <laughs> We yeah. tend to kind of recruit and recognize, et cetera, you know, using our blinders. Um, I guess the second thing I'd say, it's really obvious, um, but in this space, you need to find a way to make sure that it's a business imperative, not an HR imperative, um, that your diversity and inclusion initiatives may be enabled by HR for sure, um, 
but they're driven and role modeled by business. That's what will make them truly land. And I've been lucky in my last organizations to have had that in spades. Um, in fact, you know, at our current organization, HR has to really rally to keep up with our CEO uh, and on this topic, which is, uh, which is great. But leaders leading by example, and then you establish a guiding kind of coalition on this. And, um, you know, it goes for so many things around employee engagement experience. It's true for diversity and inclusion. In, in what are the trending talks, topics in this area? Yeah, I, I think we've talked about them. Um, they are, um, I think, first of all, we talked much more about diversity, say, five, six, seven years ago. Uh, and it's the inclusion bit that's become equally important now. Um, and uh, so you go from the what to the how, because if you focus only on diversity and, and not on inclusion, um, A, it's only half the battle, and B, you're probably not going to be very successful at keeping those people and, and getting the best out of them, all of the different people that you're trying to recruit and retain. So I think that's one piece is organizations are are talking even more about inclusion than they are about diversity in many respects. Um, so I think that's one piece. Uh, and then the second thing, again, I've said it already, is focusing now much more on attitudes, behaviors, backgrounds, philosophies. So, you know, religious differences, um, socioeconomic factors. Um, I'll give you the example here at Edelman in London. We decided that, um, in the last couple of years for our, I can't call it a graduate program because it's an entry level program now. We said a prerequisite does not need to be a university degree. We're not gonna put an age on it. It's people who would like to enter into this industry. Uh, and as a result, we broke down a lot of the barriers, uh, I think, and we ended up getting candidates at least that were from all over the place in different ages and profiles. We need to get out of our, our bubbles in many respects. And we are in bubbles because we'll recruit, you know, in the UK, we might recruit out of London. In the US, you might recruit out of New York, um, where you've got to reach further out and into communities across your countries, across your geographies to make sure that you're really and truly getting um, a diverse uh, group of people into your organization. Well, that's an interesting uh, practice, Nigel. So you've, you've You've, you've got to read, read of all the degrees. Well, what exactly, can you explain to us a little bit more of, well, about you know, the criteria? Typically, typically, you know, entry level programs in an industry like ours are called a graduate scheme, mm -hmm. right? Or something like that. There's the word graduate in it. So a, the first prerequisite is some form of university degree. Okay. Um, and then there's usually an age sort of parameter as well. Um, and maybe unspoken, but there's probably a, um, as a result of those things, it might even be a socioeconomic socio factor and a, and a geographical factor. In other words, you're generally hiring from a small group of schools. And we said, let's experiment because our clients expect to get uh, opinions and advice that come from a, the broadest possible range of influence. Um, they are expecting to get creativity that is driven by, again, a broad base of perspective, not just one or two, and not a very narrow uh, base of perspective. So we took those prerequisites out, and um, we changed the entry level pro. We called it last year. We called it the uh, the beta program. We're going to call it something else this year. Um, but in order to qualify to get through the initial rounds of qualifying, if you will, you effectively had to do an online. I'm simplifying it. My colleagues would hate me for this, but a, <laughs> an online treasure hunt. Yeah. Um, you had to uncover clues. You had to figure things out. We were looking for creativity, resilience, um, motivation to stick with it. Um, and a resilience. Uh, people who actually would, would be looking at this and go, well, I don't know if I know the answer, but I, know, I bet I know someone who does. We didn't put any limit on that. You could bring your friends in to try and figure it out. So people who had networks of, of, uh, of influence uh, that, that would help them to unlock some of these puzzles. We went back after that process where we were able to use that process to shortlist to a smaller group of, of candidates. We went back to a uh, and a, a set of assessment days that were a little more what you would expect. 
Um, but even there, um, some of the tests, some of the experiences were not any that our candidates had ever seen before. And as a result, I think we've got a, we got a really and truly outstanding mix of, of individuals into the firm. Oh, well done, Nigel, because it seems such a creative way, isn't it, to broaden your talent pool, mm -hmm. what you were doing there. Yeah, that's, uh, it, like every organization, I think one of the things you need to continue to experiment in this space, um, try different things, uh, don't be afraid to fail, um, you know, but if you fail, fail quickly and get back <laughs> on and do something else. Um, but I think largely that program, which will be adapted again this year, um, was a was a success for us quite eye-opening great and nigel we are getting to the end of our interview just before we leave each other do you have any favorite books ted talks uh articles you would recommend to our audience well i'm gonna be um a little uh predictable because <laughs> <laughs> Yes. This is my favorite oh, book so on nice. the topic. Thank you. This is my favorite. It's the one that I thought it's very thumbed through. I refer to it quite a lot. Um, we ended up uh, buying a number of these books for our employees and our leaders to uh, to refer to. Um, so it, it it's just uh, just happens that I'm talking to the author of the book here today. But it is my my favorite book on the topic, and I guess it's it's because um, it's. There's any book has some theory, um, but this book has theory and it has a real hands-on approach, some solutions, some ideas, so you can go and go, well, um, you know, what what would I do in that situation? And then you're reminded, oh yeah, that's a good idea. So I often actually refer to it. Books that are on your shelf that were a one-time read are not in this space very helpful. Books that you continuously come back to and look at and go, yeah, actually, I, I'm going to take a quote from that. Um, I, you know, I've mentioned a couple of things in our conversation. Uh, those are the books that stick around for a while. Oh, thank you, Nigel. Well, I'm really moved to see that you know you have, you seem to be making my making of my book a really useful tool. You know, so thank you so much. Yeah, if, if for, for the audience who don't who don't know, you know, about my book, the book is called "Succeed as an Inclusive Leader." Yeah, great. It is so any final thoughts final final um i i i i'll come back to where we started um i uh, and my colleagues here are trying to help our clients to create more inclusive um experiences for their employees um we are trying to help um obviously improve internal communication um help our clients to um, adapt, if they will, um, the behaviors of employees, particularly in times of change. Our insights have been that um, the employee is in many respects the single biggest driver of change success. And until recently, organizations have focused on the employee last and not first. Um, so this whole topic of diversity and inclusion is so relevant because we're living in environments that are true melting pots in the big cities. People come from all walks of life. Um, and to truly try to create an environment where those people can thrive, regardless of where they come from, regardless of what they look like, uh, that they can thrive, will, as I said, create a better employee experience, will create, ultimately create higher employee engagement. And for us, and I suspect it's true for most people listening, what's ultimately the test is you're driving better work by doing that. So um, that's what we're trying to do. Great. Thank you so much, Nigel. It's been a huge yeah. pleasure, as always. Thank you. Thank you, Thais. Thank you. And, and thanks, everyone who joined us for this conversation. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Please leave in the comments your key insights from this conversation. Share it, share this episode, like it, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. And if you want to find out more about my work, supporting companies on their inclusion journey, please visit my website, www.theclickinternational.com. 
www.decicinternational.com. See you at the next episode, I hope. And until then, embrace differences and make a difference. Bye. Bye, Nigel. Bye, Thais. Thank you.